The first seafarer deaths in the Red Sea Crisis, a container ship destroys a bridge in the port of Baltimore, and the first trial of ammonia as a marine fuel. Hi, it's Marcus Hand, editor of Sea Trade Maritime News here, with our March News Roundup Maritime in Minutes, and I'm joined by our correspondent Gary Howard. The world of global shipping in recent times has certainly not been one for those looking for a quiet life. To say we've been kept busy at Sea Trade Maritime News would be a bit of an understatement. So to kick us off with our look back at March 2024 in the world of maritime and shipping, I'm going to hand over to Gary. Thanks, Marcus. Just starting with a piece from our container man, Nick Savides, who pulled together analyst data on the Red Sea disruption's impact on container ship charter rates. The headline was a 46% increase in Braemar's boxy index since the start of the year. The root of the issue is, of course, the longer sailing times to go around the Cape of Good Hope and the capacity that's soaked up as container lines opt to take the safer route. Braemar's forecasts for its own index in 2024 have almost doubled compared to the predictions that it made at the very beginning of the year. Alpha Liner reported the usual tension between charters and owners looking to extend contracts. The owners are wary of overcommitting to a long extension in what is a pretty volatile market. Nick noted a sort of cascade effect with fixing activity starting in the larger sizes where ships are available, so not the very largest sizes, and then sort of working down through the ranks to smaller ships where the activity had become pretty frantic when his story was published. Right, over to Marcus with a specific example of why ships are opting to skip the Red Sea and take the scenic route on the Asia-Europe trades. Yes, indeed. The 6th of March brought the sadly inevitable news of the first fatalities from Houthi missile attacks on shipping in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. The bulk of true confidence was struck by an anti-ship ballistic missile, resulting in the deaths of two Filipino seafarers and one Vietnamese crew member. Two further seafarers were seriously injured in the attack. Expressing his deepest condolences to families of those who'd lost their lives, IMO Secretary General Arsenio Dominguez said, Innocent seafarers should never become collateral victims. U.S. Department of State spokesman Matthew Miller described the incident as sadly inevitable. Following the missile strike, the Houthi rebels further ratcheted up missile and drone launches. However, even ship owners that had braved out the situation until March started to reroute from the Red Sea, if possible, despite the additional fuel costs of up to $300,000 per voyage associated with diverting via the Cape of Good Hope. Meanwhile, the International Bargaining Forum representing employers and unions designated the region as warlike. Over the last week or so, the number of attacks has actually fallen off, but this could be as a result of the sharp drop in shipping traffic through the key shipping lane that connects Asia and Europe. There would actually appear to be little sign of resolution to the issue that has been impacting global shipping since November last year. And Gary, I'm going to hand back to you now for week two, and I believe you were very busy stateside. Yep. Before I started writing the script for this this morning, I sort of forgot that it happened in March. <laughs> I was out in the US in sunny Stamford, Connecticut for CMA Shipping 2024. My second time out at the event, and it was great to catch up with some US contacts and uh, enjoy the busy conference agenda. I picked a story on sort of stateside skepticism over the industry's ability to hit the indicative checkpoints IMO has set out as part of its revised greenhouse gas emission strategy. This was something I heard across a few panels and interviews, and there's sort of a trend in the naysayers' outlook on those IMO targets. Leaders from BIMCO, Intertanko, and V Group were all confident that shipping would be able to hit the 2030 target of a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, striving for 30%, a figure largely achievable just through a focus on improving efficiency of operations and technology. The 2040 checkpoint, which is a 70% reduction, striving for 80%, was where opinion split. Intertanko's Kathy Stanzel said the target was unachievable with current technologies, whereas V Group CFO Peter Traholt said the industry would definitely fail to hit the 2040 target. Stanzel likened the problem facing Intertanko's members to that of black cab drivers in London looking at the move to electric vehicles, which is range anxiety. It's all very well ordering a ship 
or a cab to run on the greenest fuels, but you need the infrastructure there in place to guarantee a supply of bunkers to keep those vessels trading. You don't want to get stuck somewhere where you don't have the fuel available to get home. BIMCO CEO David Loosely thinks 2050 is doable, while Traholt thinks the industry will miss the mark, albeit less definitely than our failure to hit the 2040 target as he sees it. It was interesting to see this conversation play out and hear the varying levels of faith people had in uh, emerging zero carbon technologies and their future availability to shipping. Marcus, over to you on the opposite side of the clock and the opposite side of the world. Indeed, I'm coming back to Singapore, where I'm based, and as this discussion was taking place, roughly, there was in fact a trial going on of one of these green fuels. And that was a trial, the world's first trial, of the use of green ammonia as a marine fuel on board a vessel. Of the alternative fuels currently being developed, ammonia comes with one of the highest risk profiles due to its toxicity. The trial on board the converted offshore vessel Fortescue Green Pioneer involved months of training and planning by the Singapore authorities. The vessel was loaded with three tons of ammonia fuel for a trial that took place over a seven week period. It included tests of ammonia storage systems, associated piping, gas and fuel delivery systems, retrofitted engines and seaworthiness. A second seven week trial should now be underway. It's very much the first baby steps in the use of ammonia and developing procedures and regulations for operating with it as a marine fuel. That being said, Australian mining group Fortescue, owner of the Singapore flag test vessel, believes it is very much the way forward and aims to retrofit its fleet of eight very large ore carriers to run on ammonia. Fortescue is not alone in its efforts to push ahead with developing ammonia as a marine fuel. AET, the tanker arm of Malaysian shipowner MISC, is expected to receive its first ammonia dual fuel tanker new building in 2025 and is understood to be already undertaking training of its crew ahead of delivery of that vessel. From the engine maker side of the equation, MAN Energy Solutions CEO Dr. Uwe Lauber told C Trade Mountain News in an interview earlier in March that it saw a strong potential for ammonia as a fuel for container ships. If you're enjoying the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on the app of your choice. And Gary, I'm going to pass back to you for more on emissions and regulations. Well, that's shocking. It's as if there's a theme in our industry of uh, decarbonisation, isn't it? There was a, a busy couple of weeks at IMO in late March with the Intersessional Working Group on Greenhouse Gas Emissions and MEPC81 running back to back in London. The working group is still chewing on those midterm measures for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the basket of options is still pretty full. A readout by UMass on the meeting said there were effectively three blocks forming with different approaches to the fuel standard and economic measures that will make up those midterm measures. There's a deadline for a decision on whether we have a greenhouse gas levy or other pricing mechanisms and whether a fuel standard includes credit trading system or emissions trading system as the IMO looks to have these agreements in place by spring 2020. which would enable them to enter into force in 2027. One more concrete bit of progress from the working group was confirmation that the greenhouse gas fuel standard will be set at a level to try and hit those IMO indicative checkpoints that we've just discussed. Of note is that if we hit our deadlines and enter into force for these measures comes in 2027, there'll only be three short years to that first indicative checkpoint in 2030. MEPC81 followed the working group and the progress there included a structure for how the net zero framework could be adopted into MARPOL Annex 6. It's a few chapters earmarked for some edits plus a whole new chapter 5, but that new chapter did get the unanimous backing of member states, which may be a good sign. Hard to tell because the the tough part of these discussions is yet to come as pressure will build up to the MEPC 83 deadline in spring 2025 when those compromises and final decisions will need to be made. There's still a long way to go, but UMass said the chances of hitting the deadlines and producing robust regulation had not fallen, which I guess we'll have to take as a positive. Back to you, Marcus. Yes, so it's going to be interesting to see how all of this plays out at IMO. In the meantime, ship owners and the technology companies that work with the industry are gearing up to try and meet these targets. And across March, I had the opportunity to sit down with several senior executives to talk about alternative fuels and methods of propulsion. These included the previously mentioned interview with 
MAN Energy Solutions CEO, Dr. Uri Lalba. And that covered a broad range of alternative fuels engines and different strategies that chip owners can go with those. And also a conversation with Kim Dietrichson, CEO of Animoy Marine Technologies about wind propulsion. Animoy produces rotor sails, and as with other wind propulsion providers, is starting to see a serious uptake in its products. So what is driving this demand? Well, Kim believes it is the need to comply with the regulations such as CII and EEXI. By fitting the likes of rotor sails, an owner can bring a vessel that currently is going to have a CII rating of D or E to a C rating or above. The regulatory factor could also explain a shift towards retrofits, whereas previously Animoy's orders were primarily for new buildings. Of course, efficiency gains also equal lower fuel costs. Based on all ships across all global trades, on an annual basis, Animoy estimates fuel savings range from 10 to 20%. And that's certainly not something that ship owners are going to be turning their nose up at. Now, moving into the last week of March, I was actually on leave, and regular listeners might have started to notice a pattern occurring when this happens. Gary, perhaps you'd like to explain. Yeah, so without making light of what was a pretty tragic story, and one that could so easily have been much worse, big stories have a habit of breaking while Marcus is on leave, as he was last week, when a container ship brought down a large bridge in the United States. The 10,000 TU box ship Darley struck one of the supports on the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland, causing the bridge to immediately collapse into the cold water below. This all happened at about half one in the morning local time. There were eight construction workers on the bridge repairing potholes in the road surface at the time of the collapse. Two were lucky to be rescued in the immediate aftermath of the collapse. The bodies of two other workers have since been recovered from the water and the remaining four are still missing, presumed dead. The key bridge carried around 30,000 cars per day, and it's likely the death toll would have been much higher had this happened during daylight hours. It's since emerged that an emergency call was made by pilots on board Dali to local authorities who managed to contact teams either side of the bridge to prevent more traffic entering the bridge in the minutes before the collision. The investigation into the cause of the incident is ongoing, but video footage of the ship approaching the bridge and audio from radio messages are consistent with the ship losing power. Dali's lights can be seen going out for a full minute in one video as it approaches the bridge before the lights come back on again and the ship's funnel emits a big thick cloud of black smoke as the engines fire up. Since the incident, Channel has now been cleared for vessels to enter and exit the port. Three ships were trapped when the wreckage of the bridge blocked navigation into and out of the port of Baltimore's terminals. I suspect they're still there as it's quite a narrow channel that's been cleared. A bunker barge was the first ship to use the channel which has a depth of 11 feet. Work has begun on a second channel with a depth of 15 to 16 feet to let slightly larger vessels get through. This is of course an ongoing story. For more information on this and the expected impacts on trade in the US and further afield, look for the Baltimore Bridge Collapse updates on Sea Trade Maritime News. Marcus, over to you for the final story and just a quick plea to never go on holiday ever again, <laughs> please. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm very unlikely to comply with that particular plea. Now, while the Baltimore Bridge tragedy has dominated our reporting at the end of March, and justifiably so, there was also some very interesting coverage related to the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, or EU ETS, by our correspondent Nick Cerides. Container lines are passing back the cost of EU ETS to their customers through a variety of surcharge mechanisms. Container line surcharges have long been an issue of controversy with shippers, and the EU ETS is proving to be no exception. A study by the Brussels-based Transport and Environment Group analysed 565 journeys taken by 20 vessels to and from Europe operated by four of the world's largest container carriers, Maersk, Hapert Lloyd, MSC and CMA CGM, and found that lines were overcharging in more than 90% of cases. An extreme case found Merce charging an extra €325,000 in levies on a voyage. For its side, Merce said that transport and environment analysed selected trades, but its analysis relied on outdated surcharge estimates for these trades. Those must have been pretty seriously outdated estimates if the numbers that transport and environment said were correct. 
For its part, the Transport and Environment claimed, while the individual profit for each voyage are not always that high, for carriers with hundreds of vessels, this represents millions in surcharge profits every year. As we move towards that global carbon pricing that we talked about at IMO earlier, this story is set to continue and potentially get much larger onto a global scale in the coming years. And if you want to learn more about this story and all the others featured in this episode, the links are in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to joining you on the next episode of the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast.